Welcome to No BS Baking. You've got JP here, and today I want to cover off a common question that pops up regularly online. Maybe you're using a new flour, adding some enrichment to the product like eggs or egg powder, almond or other non gluten flours, oat fiber, bran, milk powder, soy, or whatever. So, how much water do I need? And is there a way of determining a good start point? The answer is yes. And here's a quick walkthrough on how to determine the hydration requirements based on the ingredients you decide to use. Hydration rate refers to the speed at which an ingredient absorbs water. Absorption rates can be influenced by the amount of damaged starch, the fiber content and type, and the milling or grind size. And of course, the quantity of additional ingredients that may be competing for available water, such as sugar, salt, or other water loving ingredients. Hydration capacity, on the other hand, describes an ingredient's inherent ability to absorb and hold water. Different flours and dry ingredients have varying hydration capacities due to their composition. Main factors are generally the quantity, quality, and type of protein influences how well they can bind up water. The degree to which starch granules are damaged during milling or processing higher the damage, usually higher the hydration capacity. Pentasens are water-absorbing complex carbohydrates, polysaccharides, found in cereal grains, especially abundant in rye and whole wheat. And they significantly contribute to the ingredient's hydration capacity and can influence dough viscosity and crumb structure. Fiber content, the type, whether it is soluble or insoluble, also plays a major role. And of course, the water content of the ingredient itself. Ingredients that are drier to begin with have more room to absorb water. Simple, really. So if you're trying to dial in your hydration, it can get a bit confusing. Some resources say this and others say that. No matter which resource you choose to use as a reference, there is always a range which still leaves a lot of guesswork, brand, location in the world, how it was prepared or milled all play a factor in the hydration performance and expectations. Once you get into fibers and hydrocolloids like psyllium husk, it can really get frustrating and confusing when r and a new product or just trying to improve the nutritional profile of an existing one. So with flour, it's pretty straightforward. Depending the protein content of the AP and the white bread flour, in the protein and milling of the whole wheat, we can assume a hydration requirement in this range. If I'm not sure, I will pick a number in the middle as shown here. I then use this number to calculate the hydration requirement for the dough based on the type and the quantity of each flour used. 60% of 100 grams is 60 mils, 65% of 500 grams is 325 mils, and 80% of 400 grams is 320 mils for a total of 705 mils of water planned for this dough, or 71% rounded. Well, that looks pretty good. So now if we just substitute in some wheat gluten, use the same middle of the road principle, we can see that our hydration requirements come out at 81%. Now that looks workable from a theoretical standpoint, but what is my dough going to feel and perform like? And does this theoretical plan always work? The answer is mostly yes, sometimes no. Now, obviously, we will have other goodies in this recipe, like sugar, salt, yeast, etc. So, these need to be considered. A good start point plan using lower to middle of the road factors is one method you can use to quickly evaluate the hydration percent to see if it makes sense. Now, where it can really start looking weird is when you start playing with pre-soaked ingredients, water-thirsty fibers, fiber sugars, non-gluten powders and flours, and stuff like psyllium. So if the straight math can become problematic, how do you deal with this? When you look up hydration capacity for a particular ingredient online, be cautious. Some hydration figures cited for isolated ingredients can often represent their maximum potential water uptake under ideal conditions. In the real world of baking, these ingredients are in competition with each other, and their functional roles extend beyond just absorbing water. 
The goal with a dough or batter is for sharing optimum rheological properties. You know, how it flows, reacts, and responds during mixing, fermentation, shaping, and ultimately the finished product. Although theoretical hydration values are often considered by bakers, they are more commonly are used only for reference, especially when using fibers, starches, colloids, and other various specialty proteins and ingredients. Now, by strictly using theoretical values, one could find themselves with a big, sticky, weak, or soupy mess that ends up more like a pancake than a bread. Now, I didn't want to turn this video into a ton of reading material, as I have all this explained in painful detail in my new ebook, Next Level Functions of Ingredients, which I'll have available very soon. However, it's important to understand that we get into using specialty ingredients commonly associated with health and nutrition, that there are many considerations when planning these types of products. The amount of water you use is often determined by a holistic view, focusing on desired dough consistency and functional properties you want. Always base your hydration calculations on the total flour weight is 100%. This is standard in professional baking. Flour is key. Different flours have different water absorption capacities, primarily due to their gluten protein content, starch damage, and fiber content. Always start with a known baseline or range for your flowers and build your hydration from that baseline. I'll get into this more in a minute. When you start getting into tricky ingredients, it's a good to understand their hydration capacities and maybe doing a few calculations with the tools provided in the baking assistant for mathematically seeing the hydration impact on your dough. Is your water percent way too high? Is it too low based on the ingredients you're adding? Now, as I stated, all these ingredients vary from one brand to another and from country to country. So to make this a bit easier for you, I've researched some common sense approach and guidelines when using some of these products. When you're experimenting with new water-loving ingredients, start conservatively. Hold back 5 or 10% of the water planned at the beginning of mixing and feel the dough out, gradually adding the reserved water until you're liking the feel and consistency. For standard yeast doughs, you want the dough to feel cohesive, elastic, and is developing a good window pane. For enriched doughs, the aim for pliability and extensibility. For high hydration doughs, expect stickiness, but look for extensibility and the ability to build strength through folding. Well, I've included a few tables here that I spent a lot of time going through the numbers from various sources that I looked at and then rationalizing these down to good start point ranges when using these ingredients for baking. Now, as discussed earlier, always pick a middle of the range number when starting out until you see how your particular brand of ingredient performs. You can quickly see that a number of these adjustment factors may not directly correspond to theoretical hydration capacity but they are more so a common sense guideline when used for baking bread style products and other assorted bakery items. I realize in this video that in one breath I say you can apply practical theoretical math for calculating hydration, and you can, and I always do. And then on the other hand, I say sometimes it may not work. Now, I always do this step because I want to check to see what my dough hydration looks like based on the factors that I've used. If I don't like the look of these or I'm not feeling warm and fuzzy about my hydration plan, then I may want to take it one step further. And that next step is manual hydration evaluation. This is just really a simple little process I often use to check hydration capacity and especially to check the absorption rates. This includes simply taking a small sample of the ingredient, adding up the percent water I want to try, and then feeling and observing the ingredient as it takes up the water. After adding the water plant, I find the ingredient obviously underhydrated. It's gritty or still with dry areas, then I know I probably need more water. Likewise, if the ingredient appears uh, fully saturated and there's viewable free water when I mix it or squeeze it between my fingers, then I would probably assume I went too heavy on the hydration plant. If the ingredient displays no free water and feels plump, soft, and with the texture I want, 
then this may be a good hydration for me to try. It's important when doing a test like this to be sure you have an understanding of the absorption rates you should expect from a particular ingredient. Some ingredients significantly benefit from pre-soaking, providing the time they need to take up water, while others take up water quickly and hydrate quite easily during mixing. Additionally, you may have other ingredients that absorb quite slowly when used with cool or cold water, like inulin. However, if prepared in advance with a, with a longer pre-soak or with warm water, the hydration and or hydration rate is dramatically increased. Now, the reason I say this is because you may come across an ingredient where all the indications are that it will require, say, X amount of water. Yet you find you're dealing with a soft, sticky mess because that ingredient or ingredients have not yet absorbed the free water allocated for them to properly hydrate. So as you can see by the example below, having an ingredient slow to take up water can leave a lot of free water in your dough that can make things messy and difficult during processing. Yet, this water is important for assuring a nice texture and shelf life at the end of your baking day. As I've stated, the rheological guidelines often do not reflect the mathematical hydration requirements, but more so focus on balance for assuring workability and structural integrity required for your particular style of product. Rarely we be able to maximize hydration potential of all the ingredients, and in most cases, you don't really want to. So after conducting a theoretical hydration plan and landing at around 129%, formed a manual hydration evaluation where I got to get my head around the hydration rate and feel and see the ingredient's response to varying amounts of water. Now this led me to check my findings against the rheological chart where I determined that based on the workability I want for my dough that this would be a good start point for my first control recipe. So by inserting these numbers you can see that the hydration plan has now been reduced by near 20% which for my first go, I think is a better way to start and then I could just fine tune from here. Now if health and nutrition specific breads using some or all of the ingredients I talked about earlier is important for you and your family, then be sure to get the baking assistant. With this brand new R&D add-on, not only can you plan hydration as we just discussed, but you can scale any control recipe you made or third party recipe you found to produce the size, quantities, and types of product to fit any bread or bun plan you have. If you want to thoroughly analyze the nutrition of a recipe or build or modify one to suit your specific needs or goals, then this new addition to the Baking Assistant full version is an absolute must-have. Be sure to check it out at the link in the description.